that's not cool, Judy. You can't show me I have five minutes left and get up on stage. I'll just walk off. I'll call the day. Good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, Kyra Richter. If you guys were here last year, uh, how many were here last year for my talk? So quite a bit. Wow. Okay. Um, so I, I gave up a talk called The Last Job uh, last year here at 360 IDEV. And um, it was a, a very controversial talk. It raised uh, a lot of discussion uh, immediately afterwards at the conference. And then for months afterwards, uh, people were contacting me, people were contacting John. Um, so this year, um, I emailed John when uh, he was getting the, the conference put together. And I said, hey, you know, I want to come back and, and do a talk again. And uh, he asked me to, to come back and uh, give the, the same talk. Um, I've given this a, a couple of times now, and it's been updated over the uh, the course of the year uh, for what's happened and yeah, you know, polish and feedback. We've gotten rid of uh, some of the, the less pertinent stuff, um, so it's you'll see a lot of similarities uh, with what I talked about last time. But uh, yeah, I want to dive into it. Um, if anybody saw Mike Lee's keynote, and I imagine most of you uh, did yesterday, we have a lot of similarities in what we're uh, we're talking about today. Um, I just want to talk about the future. Um, for a little bit. And uh, when we think about the future, we as humans have a tendency to kind of go in two directions. We think about the immediate future and we think about the future involving us and we think, all right, yeah, a new iPhone's coming out next year, I'm saving up for a house, my kids are getting ready to go to college, and it's kind of in your time frame. And then when we kind of think a little bit further out than that, we get this, um, yeah, either a utopian or a dystopian kind of future mindset. And we have a really hard time with picturing what the future is going to be like. And it's part of this reason that, you know, these zombie movies and end of the world movies and stuff have been really appealing to us over the, uh, the last couple of years. It's, it's like a big reset button in our minds because we have just a hard time wrapping our heads around how fast everything is changing in society and just coupled with technology of, you know, what's actually going to happen where we're actually going to go. And it's, it's a hard topic to talk about. And we're having such trouble as a society, not just the American society, but as a world society, trying to figure out how to handle our immediate problems. And nobody's really talking about the, uh, the problems that are going to come next. So it may be hard to notice, but we're kind of in a revolution right now. And um, you know, the, the one that comes to mind a lot is to talk about the Industrial Revolution. We all know that was a huge change. We all learned about in school, people coming off the farms and into cities and manufacturing and industrialization. And I like to think a lot about where those people who were there at the moment, you know, doing their day-to-day -day lives, really realized what was happening, or whether it was just kind of in the rope of it. And if you look back at the last several years, uh, especially with the smartphones and uh, just you know, Google and the abundance of information and technology, it really starts to feel like we're in this huge curve up to something happening. So a big mistake I made last year uh, with this talk is it came off very gloomy at the uh, local media and obviously I probably can't live up to that there's less gloom this year. Is we have this impression of unemployment that's bad. Everybody here knows that unemployment is bad. We don't want to be unemployed. We don't want to be on welfare. We don't want to not work. Because it's so deeply ingrained in our DNA that you have to work, that you have to be a hunter-gatherer, that you have to contribute to the tribe, or else you're not useful in the tribe. Our ancestors would banish people who weren't contributing to society away from them, and they would die. It's part of our DNA at this point to only have people around us who are contributing. And as we move into this next revolution, we're going to see something change that is fundamentally flippant. Not only what's part of written history, historic history, what we know about from the last five, six thousand years, but predates that hundreds of thousands of years into our evolution for what we need to change and what we need to wrap our heads about. So I want to start at the very, very beginning. Hunters and gatherers. This is a picture of the last tribe in Africa who still does persistence hunting. And this is the method of hunting that we used in Africa in our early, early days. And this is what humans were designed very well for. We all know the cheetah is the fastest land mammal. And uh, you know, we know that we can't compete with a lot of other animals or speed. And we develop spears and bows and these kind of things. And this is where we, we think our advantage came from. 
on the evolutionary track to get us to where we are is using tools. But before we got there, we had to survive as a species. And this was done by just terminating the, uh, the antelope or the prey that we're going after. It's, it's just absolutely terrifying. Uh, some of you may have heard that the best endurance animals on land are humans. We run marathons, we can go forever. If you've ever run with a dog, the dog can do a few miles. It's much, much faster than you. But it can't hang in for the very long haul. So what we used to do as a species is we would find whatever we felt like eating that day, uh, antelope or you know, whatever looked tasty to us, and uh, we would start to jog after it. And clearly the antelope would jet away way too fast for us. It would sprint away and take off to uh, some place with some shade and some water and kind of rest up. And humans would continually chase it down and go after it. And we would catch up to it, and it would stand up, and it would sprint away again. And this would go on over and over and over again until the antelope got so tired and so unable to fight it anymore, it would just lay down and succumb to its fate. And uh, there's some BBC uh, footage and there's some National Geographic footage of them following around these tribes. And it's a really interesting way to look at humanity because what it tells me is that we are extremely persistent that we're not going to give up, that we're always going to push and drive to accomplish our tasks. And that's what we've shown as a species. We've colonized the entire planet. We are absolutely everywhere. It's like a jolly rancher covered with ants is what Earth looks like right now. It is all human, everywhere you look. So as we started to develop technology, which is what happens in the uh, intelligent civilization, we didn't have to, to gather out and go look for berries and fruits anymore. We didn't have to follow the herd migrations. We started farming. And for the first time, we got into a system where you didn't need 100% of the people of the tribe gathering food anymore. Now you could have 99 people gathering food for 100 people. Suddenly you had one person who didn't have to work at supplying food or material or contributing to the life of the tribe in that manner. And we could start moving on to other things. And we created masons and poets, priests. All these new jobs came about because we didn't have to be out there all the time hunting for our food. And this went on for a very, very long time. We saw kind of a gradual drop in the agriculture percentage of humanity. And then we started going into a new revolution. We started to build tools, not just to ease our work a little bit, but to replace manual labor as a whole. And this is really the first job revolution, is we built tools that made what we were doing easier. We were using levers to, to help move rocks, and big holes with uh, trench diggers, and, all this stuff started to become a lot easier for us. This is a, a picture of a cotton gin, uh, actually, which was a, a, a tool to help remove cotton seeds from cotton for, for processing. Um, so we started to replace all these jobs and uh, bring in machinery that could really only do physical labor because it wasn't the computer age yet. The machines weren't very smart. They just kind of made our lives a little bit easier, so we we're not out in the fields all day. And this is where we are now. We're sitting on computers and we're typing. And, you know, there's not too many people out there who are doing hard manual labor. We still have a lot of those people, but not nearly as much as we did in the past. We started to see all these tech jobs. Um, telegraph operators were a, a real big one. And uh, when these were popular and when we used the, the telegraph, it's a lot like computer engineers. We were laying cable all over the country and the whole world, and we started to have to have a lot of telegraph operators because we're sending information all over the place. And this was considered a very high-tech job at the time. It was high-paying. Uh, you were considered you know, very intelligent to be part of it. It's very much like computer science is today. And then what we really started to do was we started to build automated farms. And this was the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. And this is where stuff really, really changed for us, is we now had one or two people that could provide food for 10,000 people. And it's no longer a huge part of our society to have to produce food. The few farmers that we have left tend to work on mega farms. There's not a lot of these small family farms. It's to the point where you know, we've hipsterized family farms and it's like a, a niche thing that we go after. There's no need for them anymore. It's all huge industries. 
And we've seen the computers come into this as well, above and beyond the labor stuff. This is a um, strawberry picking, uh, which up until a couple of decades ago was all done by hand. And if anybody's ever grown strawberries, it's, it's a pretty intensive process. Strawberries don't really ripe in the same pattern or time. So on one bush of strawberries, you may have something that's ripe and ready to go and another bundle that's not. So it's a, it's a hard problem to solve. How do you, you know, pick strawberries with you know, making sure you get the ones that are perfectly ripe and leave the other ones on there. Um, this is a, a computer that uses uh, advanced optics and it, it moves actually really, really quick. There's a video on YouTube and it just kind of shoots up and down these rows of strawberries picking you know, hundreds every you know, minute. And it will analyze the strawberry and pick the, uh, the fresh ones. And what this has caused is just a huge drop off in the percent of our population that's working in agriculture to a point where we're getting down to a fractional percent. So we're probably not going to see too much more of a drop off here because there's not really much to do. So as we know, when we have all these people available to us, we started to create new jobs, high tech jobs, business jobs, management, factory workers, all this kind of stuff. And we started to see this second wave here. The automatic color machines were kind of the, the first move here that we really saw introduced into society. If you talk to people who were growing up in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, they didn't really see a lot of ATM machines. And then suddenly they started to be everywhere. What a lot of people forget is that an ATM machine is actually replacing a human. They're replacing a teller. It's an automatic teller machine. So when you go to the bank now, there may be one or two tellers working at the bank, and there might be 10 or 15 ATMs scattered around. And bank tellers used to be a much bigger industry than they were. So we see these sort of new high-tech jobs getting replaced. And what we've always been told in school, we've been told by our mentors and our parents, is that you know, technology is coming, we're not going to stop it. And what happens is we lose these low-paying, kind of manual, non-thinking jobs, but we replace them with better-off high-tech jobs. And clearly, we all follow that advice because I would imagine almost everybody here is some sort of uh, software developer or works in the uh, development industry. Otherwise, you got lost and you want to be upstairs at another conference. So we started to see these highly specialized robots come about. And when we think of robotics, this is a lot of times what we think about. And we say, yeah, well, the robots have been here for a long time. We started making robots in the 80s that didn't work. And you know, a lot of what we talk about is the loss of American manufacturing in the 70s. So you know, a lot of manufacturing went overseas. The manufacturing we were still doing here, a lot of it became automated. This is kind of a trick. These robots are highly, highly specialized. The only thing that you know, one of these robots does is it knows the well of this spot for X milliseconds and just does that over and over and over again today. It's not a smart robot like we're starting to see now. It's very suited to a specific job and they cost a lot of money. But once you build one, they're pretty good to go for a while. There may be some maintenance and stuff that you have to do on it, but you build a $200,000 robot, you might get 10 or 15 years out of it in the factory. I think, well, that's a lot of money for a robot. But then you're thinking, well, we used to pay somebody $60,000 a year to do this, and we had workman comp, we had unemployment, we had people getting drunk on the job, we had all kinds of issues with it. So it was more economical to put these highly specialized robots in. And this was kind of that, that robot revolution. All the 80s movies are full of robots. Robots were everybody was talking about 30 years ago. Everybody wanted a robot. And we had them. They just weren't very smart yet. This is the new wave of job automation. And uh, you'll see these in any retail outlet now. It's, it's getting very rare that you can go to a, a big store, grocery store, Home Depot, uh, Best Buy, and not have some sort of automated checkout process. And once again, these are replacing cashews. And what they found is that one, you have a single person watching a bank of eight or 10 or 12 of these, so it cuts down a lot on your employee cost. And two, people actually like to use these. We've come a little bit uh, of a hermit society at this point where we don't like interacting with people that we don't know. And there are very few people who go, you know, I can't wait to go talk to a cashier at the food store. It's not really what we're looking for. We have our friends, we have Facebook, we're connected to everybody all the time. I can talk to my friend in Germany tonight. It's not a big deal. I'm not looking for a conversation with the person who's checking me out. So we're kind of seeing these, these you know, low-paying, low-work jobs disappear. We're thinking, well, that's not a big deal. 
you know, this doesn't really affect me. Maybe it adds a little bit more to unemployment. But these people are going to find other jobs. This is a very serious image. This is a little bit over a year ago now this happened. If anybody can't tell, this is a butter swastika on top of a bun. Now, we know that uh, the swastika, Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, they're very sensitive topics. There are people who are still alive today who went through those. We have family members who suffered through this stuff. It's, it's an extremely insensitive image. And what happened here is a minimum wage teenager at McDonald's. He made a, a chicken sandwich that had a butter application to a bun. His job was to apply butter to the bun of a McDonald's sandwich. He decided that the best butter application was in the form of the swats. Um, unfortunately, this is a really wonderful way to apply butter because it covers the whole bun. Unfortunately, it's a symbol of hate. Uh, the customer who bought it um, was of Jewish descent. She took the bun off to apply some additional condiments, so she noticed it. And um, she contacted the local media, and it spiraled out of control. Local media picked it up, state media picked it up, national media picked it up. It's on CNN, MSNBC. It was a whole big deal of, you know, McDonald's is now, you know, in line with Nazi Germany. They're in force of hate. They're letting them get away from stuff. This kid was making seven fifty an hour. You know, the CEO of McDonald's had no idea this guy was. The manager at the McDonald's probably didn't even know who this kid was. It's like 40 people working at McDonald's making minimum wage. They probably worked there for a month or two. So now in the boardroom of McDonald's corporate headquarters, you have 50 lawyers, the CEO, CFO, the chairman of the board of directors spending their entire afternoon sitting down and dealing with this problem. In the end, between the, uh, the PR damage, the, uh, the lack of customers who boycotted it for a time period, any possible lawsuits that may have come with this, this one incident could have easily cost McDonald's 10, 20, 50 million dollars. For somebody making seven dollars and fifty cents an hour. Now, if I'm the CEO of McDonald's, the first question I'm going to ask myself is, why are we bothering with this? And they're not. Yeah, we're seeing this uh, push a little bit more with the uh, the fight for the fifteen dollar minimum wage and things like that, but. The reality of the situation is you don't want to pay somebody to do a low-level job and give them the opportunity in the information age to do such tremendous damage to your business that a kid making minimum wage at 16 years old at a McDonald's in rural America can interrupt the flow of one of the largest corporations on earth. So we introduced the McDonald's self-checkout. Starting to see these pop up pretty quick. Um, has anybody seen one of these in a local McDonald's yet? A couple people. They'll be there very soon. Uh, you walk in and instead of seeing the cashier, you order on the screen. It's kind of nice because you don't have to like argue about like extra cheese or you know no onions. It's, you press the button for it and you're done. You pay on the thing and you leave. Um, these boxes probably cost McDonald's maybe $100,000 each to install. And uh, you figure they're paying maybe $30,000 a year for an employee. So there's a cost factor with it. But you have to keep in mind that the machine doesn't get sick, doesn't come to work drunk or on drugs, doesn't sexually harass their co-workers, doesn't put swastikas on their food, and uh, certainly doesn't jump over the bar at Burger King to beat a customer with a metal pipe, uh, which is an incident that happened a couple of years ago. Now, they ruled it was self-defense. The uh, customer was pushing at the, uh, the employee and stuff like that. But imagine being a CEO at Burger King and getting a phone call that your minimum wage employee has beat a customer with a metal pipe while at work. You don't want that phone call. And we're seeing it all over the place. Panera Bread is a, is a big pusher of uh, this kind of technology. And there are Panera Breads now that are out there that have no cashiers. You walk in, you order at one of these kiosks, it prints you out a little ticket, you go sit at the table, and still, for the time being, a human will come out and deliver your food to you. Um, I say still, because we are quickly moving away from this. This is a Japanese robot that has been trained to cook a variety of different meals. And we can do this because we know cooking is a very automated system. I mean, that's why we have recipes. We know how much ingredients to add, what to do, how long to mix stuff. So we can automate that kind of stuff. And we're seeing these pop up in real world uh, situations here. This is in an Aloft hotel in Cupertino. 
If anybody's out visiting Apple, I recommend going to the Aloft Hotel because you can get a robot butler at the Aloft Hotel. And if you forget a towel or your toothpaste or a razor, you call down to the front desk and they send the robot on up with your, uh, your stuff. So what we're all thinking here is, all right, great, you know, we're going to lose the, uh, the bellboys, we're going to lose the cashiers, fast food. This isn't a big deal. We know these jobs are going to go away. They're low-skill jobs. They're easy to automate. I'm safe. I'm a lawyer, I'm an engineer, I'm a surgeon, I have a master's degree, I have a doctorate degree, I know what I'm doing, this job cannot be replaced. Unfortunately, there's a lot more motivation to automate those jobs. And what we're seeing now is, especially in surgery, when you're doing precision surgery, when you're working on a heart or a brain, or even an appendix, any little mistake can be disastrous. And when you're in there for a couple of hours holding the scalpel with a little you know, microscope on your eye, trying to make the right cut, your hands start shaking, you sneeze, you cough, you possibly even have a seizure. Any number of things can go wrong with the human body. And when you have your hands holding the scalpel inside somebody else's body, you don't want any of those things going wrong. So what we're doing now is we have these robotic surgeons. You can clearly see here. And we're not quite at the point yet where the surgery is completely automated. And you can see on the, the far left there in the, uh, the lighter blue is the surgeon who's actually controlling the robot. And this is where the technology is right now. If you go into a modern hospital and you get one of any number of routine surgeries, they may be using this system. And what I want to propose to you is how complex is an apodectomy? How much information do we not know about that surgery yet that we can't write a software program that can go in and perform that just as well as any surgeon? A routine surgery, when you already have the robot, when the only thing that's missing is removing that surgeon and putting a script in place to follow a direct procedure of events. Do we really think we're that far off from having that surgeon not have to be there anymore? From having the robot be able to make the decisions faster, better, and more proven than the human surgeon. This leads to a whole bunch of really interesting topics. The military, of course, is extremely interested in automation of jobs because the hard part about fighting a war is losing your citizens. It's losing your sons and daughters, your mothers and fathers, your friends and family. War has a tremendous toll on the society. It has a toll on society because of the human life loss. How do wars change? when you no longer have to put your own citizens in jeopardy? How much do we debate going to war with Iran when the chance of an American loss of life is zero? Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, and Steve Wozniak recently got together and uh, they started a, a petition along with uh, a couple thousand scientists and researchers to prevent the arming of artificial intelligence. Now, that might seem like a ridiculous statement. I mean, when we think of artificial intelligence with guns, we think of Terminators. And we're thinking, man, nobody out there is really that stupid to give a machine gun to a Terminator yet, right? We've seen the movies. We know uh, Skynet. We're not going to harm these things. Unfortunately, it's the path that we're going down. And it's not going to be a Terminator overnight. There's not going to be some robot walking around with a machine gun. It's going to be a drone that can automatically acquire its targets. It's going to be a police robot that's designed to breach doors and secure a hostage situation. It's going to be a gradual move to that type of society. So, we need to be extremely careful about how we use artificial intelligence. And as a species, artificial intelligence is the future. We have 7 billion people on this planet all trying to have everything. Everybody's trying to have a big screen TV, Everybody wants a nice house in the yard. You know, if you're in a third world country, yeah, you want food and shelter, clothing first. But when you get those, you're going to be start looking for, well, I want transportation. You know, I want good food. I want protein. I want meat every day. And when you have an entire planet, an arguably overcrowded planet, with everybody looking to have it all, all the time, the only way that's even remotely feasible to do anything even close to that is to have a race of the lower class. That lower class 
may be artificial intelligence in the future. And it makes a lot of sense. If we always need a lower class, but we want all humans to, to not be in it, we need to bring in some sort of slave race. And unfortunately, we don't want to enslave other people. That's not good for us. That is terrible. We don't want to be those people. So we build a race of robots and we enslave them. So what's this all actually mean right now? This is the Port of Rotterdam. And, uh, <laughs> and until 2002, this was the largest port in the entire world. It handled more cargo than anybody else. Right now they handle 450 million tons of cargo a year. Just try to wrap your head around that because you're dealing with a million and then tons on top of it. It's a lot of cargo. They currently employ about 180,000 people. Rotterdam Port is one of the most automated shipping centers in the world. They have gotten behind the technology. They are leveraging the technology. They are letting go of a lot of people to automate the process. Because the Dutch, who are traditionally shippers and trade people, they do it very, very well. And they realized that the process of unloading and loading ships and transporting cargo was something that is easily automated. The RFID chips and stuff, you know, where they're going, how to unload them, it's a very scriptable problem. This is potentially the scariest thing. Uh, that's going to happen this decade. And it's scary because a lot of the stuff that we talk about, there's slow changes. Automating the port, yeah, it's not going to happen overnight. But there are a couple of inventions throughout history that have been so impactful that you don't have that standard 20 or 30 year adaption time. That it happens so quickly that you turn around and the entire civilization is changed. And it's happening even quicker in the information age. Our ability to move to the next step is a lot faster than it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago. We can change society with software and technology extremely quick. And the self-driving car represents replacing a class of worker that makes up a huge portion of the workforce. There are a lot of people in this country who work in transportation, whether they're taxi drivers, long haul truckers, ambulance drivers, food delivery, a lot of people's jobs depend on driving a vehicle from point A to point B. <coughs> Google's got this down. We've been watching this for a couple of years. I don't think there's anybody in here who's too skeptical of self-driving cars at this point. What did just happen in May was Nevada has officially granted its license for the first autonomous self-driving long-haul truck to be used on Nevada streets and highways. This is where stuff's going to change. Because a self-driving truck doesn't drive in his tire, doesn't do drugs, doesn't get in a fight with his girlfriend and drive recklessly, doesn't do a whole bunch of caffeine pills and have a heart attack on the road. It changes everything. Right now in the United States, on average, 40,000 people a year are killed in traffic accidents. It's a terrible number. It's a lot of deaths. It far exceeds a lot of other things that we worry about in this country, but everybody's got to drive, right? We all have places to be. If a self-driving car system can reduce that fatality rate by 90%, which is aggressive but realistic, and the early testing and driving self-driving cars say that they're going to do just that. That drops the road fatalities in the United States per year to 4,000. Still a high number, much better than 40. The problem that we're going to have <coughs> is when you die in a car accident that was because of a self-driving car, it opens up a whole new world of possibilities. As soon as we make decisions when we're driving, and as some of you may know, we protect the driver's side of the car by instinct. So if you get into an accident, the safest spot to be is behind the driver. Because subconsciously, that driver will protect themselves. And that's a human fault 
that we've all acknowledged and we accepted. We say, you know, if you get into a car accident, you know, we know it's an accident. We know you're going to try to protect yourself. You're not going to be in control of it. Maybe you swerve off the road and hit a kid on a bike, as terrible as that would be. You know, we might not be able to fault you for that if you weren't drunk and you weren't driving recklessly. If you have a self-driving car and it detects an accident is going to happen, that piece of code now determines, do I kill the kid on the bike? Do I kill the driver of the car? And now there is going to be a line of source code that is going to wind up in the courtroom and a lawyer is going to point to it and he's going to say, this is the line of code written by Toyota that decided that your life was less valuable than the kid on the bike. And that opens up a very, very scary world. Because now it's no longer the driver got into an accident. It's now the car made a conscious decision to kill somebody. Not aggressively, not maliciously, not a terminator with a gun. It weighed the options and it figured out what the least impactful hit to society would be. Who is responsible for that death? Somebody authorized it. Was it the developer? Was it the company that made it? It's going to be argued in the courtroom very soon. And it's going to be a really scary topic. The 1950s, the FAA started tracking the cause of airline crashes. And what they've determined since then is that when you remove hijacking and you remove bombings and you remove terrorism from the equation, 61% of airline crashes are directly related to recoverable pilot error. If we can fly drones halfway across the world from a warehouse in Nevada why can't we fly commercial planes from one airport in the United States to another? If we can remove that pilot error, 61% of airline crashes may not happen. But would you get on a plane that had no pilot? The reason I feel comfortable on a plane is because I know that that pilot can't do anything to me that they don't do to themselves. It's the same reason you get into a taxi, it's the same reason you get into a car with a friend and you feel safe going 75 miles per hour down the highway and steal box. Is because for something to happen to you, it has to happen to them. If you're on a plane with no pilot that's being flown by somebody in Nevada, what happens then? If they crash the plane, do we shoot them in the back of the head? Do we put them in the same position as the passengers that they carry? Amazon. Well, getting some very bad press lately, unfortunately, because uh, I certainly do like uh, Amazon as a company. You can't argue with their business practices. They have an extremely slim margin, and they've been able to capture just a huge percentage of the uh, market. They're one of the most trusted shopper retailers online. I get almost all my stuff through Amazon because I know their support's going to be fantastic. I know the logistics are great. I know it's just going to work out for me. Amazon, who's had razor thin profit margins the entire time they existed, in March of 2012, they spent $775 million to acquire a company called Kiva. <laughs> Huge amount of money for a company with profit margins that thin. Kiva built robots. And what their robots do, you can actually see them in this image here, they're little orange things because not all robots look like uh, on a sports finger, unfortunately. Uh, they go around, they actually pick up the shelf and they take them to the, uh, the loader, where previously they had what they called walkers at Amazon and they would walk up and down these aisles picking up materials. So not only do they not have to employ hundreds of people anymore to go and pick up materials, they can also fit more stuff into the warehouse. You don't have to have the aisles as big and stack stuff on top of each other. So Amazon was able to get rid of, and the warehouses where they deployed it so far, all their, their walkers and uh, pickers and replaced with robots. It's a huge upfront cost, $775 million just for the company, not to mention what they have to pay to actually build out each warehouse. For a company that doesn't make that much money, they're clearly on top of something here. They're thinking, we buy these robots, we employ them for $20,000 or $30,000 a piece. They're good to go for 10 years. They even go and charge themselves like a Roomba 
they have a little charger station they go to when they're getting low. So we're seeing these kind of col cons uh, consolidation of uh, these jobs. And then we're seeing something else really interesting happen above and beyond that. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, IBM came up with an artificial intelligence platform. Whether you actually want to call it artificial intelligence is a semantical debate. It may not actually be artificial intelligence yet. That's kind of a loaded word. But they came up with a computer system. And then they had it play Jeopardy. And uh, believe it or not, IBM didn't spend uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to build a Jeopardy robot. But it was pretty fun to watch and destroy humanity anyways. Um, Watson was originally built to do exactly what it did on Jeopardy, but for the good of humanity. It would analyze uh, a bunch of input, uh, like a Jeopardy question, and it would pick the most likely output for it. And we saw some really funny stuff with it where it thought the, uh, the most popular non-dairy creamer in the United States was milk. But at the same time, it gave us a lot of right answers. What Watson was actually designed to do was a medical diagnostic platform. And IBM's end goal for this is to have every doctor's in the office, every doctor's office in the world with an iPad or some sort of equivalent tablet device that has Watson on it. And they would input the symptoms uh, that you give them and it would spit you back out. You know, you have an X percent chance of this resistance. And what's really interesting about this is doctors' knowledge is based around the previous cases that they've worked with, what they're familiar with, what they've seen before. Imagine a computer that every single sick person, even just in the United States, is like, talking to it at once. New outbreaks of diseases could be caught in minutes. Trends, vaccination failures, all this kind of stuff is now instantly available. Imagine a doctor that sees a million patients a day. That's going to be the doctor that I want to go to. And even in kind of this early infancy of uh, Watson still, if you were to go to your human doctor, your general practitioner, and you would be able to list the symptoms that you had if you had lung cancer, that doctor has a 50% chance of correctly diagnosing that you may have lung cancer. 50% chance in a disease that every single day of treatment matters. Given the same exact symptoms and that same exact patient, information to Watson has a 90% correction rate to diagnose you with cancer. 90%. So what we're thinking here is, yeah, this stuff is all automatable. We know it's coming. We know that you know, the future is going to be wonderful. We're going to have all this great technology. But we can't replace that spark of humanity. You, know, you can't have a machine write poetry or compose a beautiful classical piece of music. You can't have it you know, write articles for you know, CNN. These are a spark of humanity, something inside our brain that we can't replicate, that you know, can't be matched. There's a company called Quill, and uh, what Quill does is it pretends to be a human. And companies like um, Fox News and CNN, um, Yahoo Finance, they hire Quill to come in and generate articles for them. So if we have a baseball game or a stock quote, we can then abstract all that data, put it into a human readable format, and post an article as if somebody sat down and did the writing themselves. So it cuts down a lot on those costs. And yeah, so far that's not very creative, right? You know, taking a, a baseball game and extracting the information out of it and writing an article is not creative. But there are some robots out there that are getting pretty creative. This is one of my uh, one of my favorites. This piece of music was completely composed and played by a robot with no human interaction whatsoever. What they did was they gave the robot input of the top 100 or so classical pieces of music, and it determined why it thought people would like that music. What about patterns and recognition it can pull out of them? And this is what it came up with. It's a completely original score that when played to people who enjoy this type of music, couldn't tell the difference something composed by a robot and something composed by a human being. So what we've all heard our whole lives is tech improvements create more jobs and people feels that pay better. My
My professors told me this in school. My parents told me this. My boss has told me this. This is something that we just hear. Yeah, we're going to get rid of the, the mindless jobs. That's why we're not all farmers right now. And, you know, we're going to have new stuff like software engineer or pine traveler or, you know, other cool stuff that we don't have yet. The introduction of the automobile will create more jobs or forces in new fields that will be better. It's not really different. I mean, we're just replacing ourselves with, uh, with horses. And it's, uh, it's true. The horses out there tend to have better jobs than uh, they had before. They're not pulling tons of cargo around. They're not moving giant blocks of ice up and down the, uh, the roads. They're, they're working in parks. They're pulling you know, couples around Central Park for a date. Or you know, they're police riot horses who are you know, standing guard. They're not doing crazy intensive stuff. But no fault of the horse themselves. They found themselves unemployed and unneeded. The horse didn't go to school and get the wrong major. It didn't go, hey, you know, I think I might want to be a psychologist. Let me go get a four-year degree in that and see how it goes. They didn't make the wrong decisions. They didn't get stupid. They didn't get lazy. You know, they didn't watch too many cartoons. They didn't spend too much time on Facebook. They just weren't needed anymore. Technology came along and gave them better options. So about the only reason that we use horses in riot control uh, trivia tidbits is not because you know they're ideal for the situation or you know give some sort of benefit. We could do the same thing with motorcycles or just cops on foot. Horses have a genetic uh, mutation that makes them immune to tear gas and pepper spray, and that's why we use them in riot control situations. And you see the cops with the gas masks and stuff, but you never see the horses with the gas masks outside of the mustard gas in World War One, obviously. Buster gas kills horses, uh, as it kills people, but tear gas they're completely fine with. So, Oxford University uh, a couple of years ago did a study on uh, the jobs that are at extreme risk for automation. They gave it a 10 year time span. They did this study back in 2013, I believe. And um, these are jobs they came up with that are at extreme risk of uh, automation in the next 10 years. I don't think there's a lot of surprises in there. We're already starting to see a lot of this stuff, uh, the automated, and even more time to do some stuff. We've seen those automated little robots that people are starting to put on Kickstarter. And it's going to be a while, but yeah, I mean, this is a good percentage of the, the population. I'm sure everybody here knows somebody who works as a retailer, taxi driver, security guard, cook, bartender. Somebody's got friends or family uh, in those. Mike talked about this a little bit yesterday. This is the, uh, the theoretical population of the, uh, the world. And uh, there are a couple of projections here. Uh, they're UN projections, uh, high, mid, and low. And um, they actually, they're susceptible with Mike was talking about, which is uh, just nice to see. Uh, we have one half that will you know, shoot us up and puts us into that curve that we can never recover from. That's that angry red line there. Um, the orange line represents the, uh, the roughly 10 billion uh, earth carrying capacity, which is uh, what a lot of people think the Earth can actually support as far as a, uh, a human load. <coughs> and the, uh, the final one is the, uh, the low estimate, we, we drop back down. So what we're talking about is we're talking about a lot of jobs disappearing and a lot more people on Earth. So we get to this like, weird situation uh, where we also might live for a really, really long time uh, because we're making hearts and labs and all kinds of crazy medical advancements, bionics. Um, there's a decent chance uh, that somebody alive today on the planet is going to live to 150, uh, even if you're not really an optimist. Um, there's a pretty good chance of that. There's a, a pretty good chance that there are people alive today who will never die. Uh, Something kind of think about for a second messes with your head a little bit. Um, but, you know, what do we do with all these people if we have 10 billion people on Earth, they're living to two, 300 years old maybe, and uh, they don't have to work? It's a big problem. It's a problem that nobody's really talking about yet. And just in the last year, we've seen a couple of people starting to try to bring a little bit of focus to it. Um, there's a city in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, you might be actually seeing a pattern here. The Netherlands are actually really good at forward thinking and automation and stuff like that. Uh, it's called uh, Utrecht. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Judy, is that close enough? That's eh, close enough. Um, they actually instituted basic income. 
Um, it's not quite unconditional basic income, it's kind of a modified welfare. And um, as far as all the systems out here, this is really the only one that doesn't involve us killing everybody who's of the lower class and living on yachts with robots. Um, so I mean, I've never been a big fan of unconditional basic income, but nobody's really come up with anything better yet. Um, so you track uh, instituted this uh, universal basic income, and it's basically every single citizen, every single man, woman, adult in the country is going to get a stipend. You know, let's say twelve thousand dollars a year, and whether you work or not, you get that money. It's kind of a welfare type system. It's not really welfare though; it has a real negative connotation. So, and then if you work, you know, if you go be a software developer, or you go work in fast food, you get money above and beyond that. So the idea of unconditional basic income is your basic living expenses, your rent, your food, your clothes, are covered. They're taken care of by the, uh, the state, the world government, whatever you have. You know, there's a, a baseline, and then the people who work in above and beyond that. And it's really one of the few methods that you can have 30 or 40% unemployment and not have the whole system collapse. And that's where we're going towards, is this really high unemployment rate. Not Again, not because we majored in the wrong fields or we're lazy or all the jobs are going to China. There's just no need for us to work like this anymore. And we have so deeply ingrained in our heads and our DNA that we have to work, that this is such a hard topic to wrap our heads around. We just, we can't come to a conclusion that we will eventually at some point, whether it's 10 years, 50, 100, 10,000 years, that we won't need the work anymore. And I firmly believe that it's in our lifetimes. Some people may, you know, push it a little bit further out, but if you're thinking 10,000 years in advance, do we really want people working 40 hour weeks still? Do we really think that every single human being on this planet, on any other planets we happen to go infest, need to have jobs? It seems ridiculous that we can't build robots to do everything for us. It's the Jetsons' future. Why isn't it here? So Moore's Law is probably something everybody's familiar with, uh, being software people. The, um, the number of transistors on a dense integrated circuit approximately double every two year. Uh, we modified it a little bit post that because the transistors get a little bit more powerful at the same time. So it really comes down to every 18 months in practice. And we've seen that kind of throughout history. Um, here's my favorite projection of, uh, of Moore's Law, by the way, because you can kind of see how we, we move from the electromagnetic to the relay to the magnitude of the transistors in the integrated circuit. We see even, you know, we get these kicks of new types of technology that we're still kind of on this path. Well, you know, if we look at this chart and we look at computer science, we know we're going to end up at one place. We know what's happening. We know what we're on the course for. And actually, we know it's going to happen around 2040, which really isn't too far away. It's called the singularity. And there are two events in potential human history, the future of humanity, that are going to be so explosive, so changing to everything that we know, that we can't see anything past it. It's like looking into a black hole. The first is human contact with an, intel with an intelligent alien species. If that ever happens, everything will change so fast overnight that there's absolutely no way to predict the outcome. They may destroy us, they may give us all their technology, they may let us into secrets of multiple dimensions. There's no way to figure out what's going to happen past that event. The singularity is no one. And what happens in the, the event of the singularity um, is computing power equals that of the human brain. So the computers are now smarter than humans. And in theory, what we can do is we can tell the computer to take a couple of milliseconds and build a better computer. We can have that better computer take a couple of milliseconds and build a better computer. And we hit this kind of like really infinite timeline of, you know, such rapid advancement in technology that it should lock, unlock all the secrets of everything. The problem is, what do we do with people at this point? It's really like a prenatal unemployment. If we have computers who are smarter than people, and we have robots doing all the jobs, we're living virtually forever. Why are we still here? And uh, I don't have an answer for you, I just wanted to depress you a little bit. But um, Singularity was, uh, was predicted for uh, 2040, uh, about 50 years ago. And uh, every couple of years they, uh, they go back and they look at the math and they crunch it. And we're still pretty much on track for 2040. Um, so certainly something to uh, think about there. And there's, there's a lot of other caveats. Um, you know, we 
actually download and upload our brands to and from computers. You know, there's more to it than just building a computer as fast as processing as a human. So we have this thing that we call future blindness. And uh, you're all sitting there now going, you know, Kyle's kind of an idiot. He's talking about all this stuff that can't possibly exist. I mean, I was growing up in the 60s. They called us jetpacks by the 80s. Where are my jetpacks? Where are my flying cars? I don't even have a hoverboard yet. Back to the future lied to me. It's ridiculous. So why is the stuff that we're talking about today not the same as talking about a jetpack or a hoverboard or that kind of stuff? I mean, we don't do that class of science fiction. They kind of took a couple of leaps ahead. They weren't looking at, all right, you know, we can go to the moon. The next step is, you know, a space station, then go into Mars. They said, well, you know, the next step is going to uh, another galaxy. So you jump too many steps ahead, and you don't look at, you know, what's going to happen when we get this next piece of technology, what's going to come immediately after that. So we start saying, hey, you know, we have five planes. Maybe we should have, uh, you know, jetpacks. Yeah, you know, that seems like the next logical thing. And you just toss too many variables into it. You're looking too far ahead. You're not following the steps properly. And you wind up with something like the Jetsons, where you know everybody's got a flying car, and you know we're still not there yet. So I'm going to leave you uh, with this: is you know it all kind of sounds like it's out of our reach that we can't interact with this. That's going to happen no matter what. But you know we're software developers. We work in the software industry. Whether or not you can make a thing on what the future is doing, you really are. Um, you might not be working for you know, SpaceX, you might not be you know, building a, a rocket ship or figuring out how to mine an asteroid, but you know, we're at a point in our civilization where every little bit of technology is adding to each other. Maybe you wrote a framework or an SDK that's going to be used by somebody who's going to do something great. Maybe you're given somebody the option to stand on your shoulders and reach one step ahead of work. But, you know, there's no reason to, to fear the future. Yeah, I mean, when we come up here and we say, yeah, there might be 40 or 50% unemployment in the future, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It means that we're going to have to change the past. But, you know, I'd much rather not have to work than to feel like I'm a slave to a world that has to have 5% unemployment. It feels like a really bad trade-off to say, I don't want change, so I'm going to force all of humanity to work 40 hours a week. So, you know, all of us have the option and the ability to, to come in and steer this in the right direction. Um, as tech people, you know, a lot of societies have been looking to us on the best technical behavior and what we stand up for. You know, when, uh, when Elon Musk or, you know, Amazon comes out with a new piece of software like the Echo, people look towards the tech community to see if this is an ethical move, it's something that we should get behind. And people listen to the tech people. A lot of society out there doesn't have the background that we have to know whether the choices that these companies are making are things that they should get behind. And it's our responsibility to make sure that you know we're not sitting down and being quiet when something's not going right, when somebody's not treating the world in the way that it needs to be treated in. And we need to stand up and make sure that our voices are being heard. And for the first time in history, it's so easy for one person to reach so many different people. I and mean, only in the last 15 or 20 years has one person been able to write an app or a blog or a book that just impacts such a wide variety of, uh, of the society of Earth and you know, really be heard. For the longest time, it was the big corporations that had that ability. It wasn't up to us as individuals, but we have a bit of the power now, and it's worth our time to make sure that we're using it responsibly. Uh, if these are interesting topics for you, uh, there's a couple of great books uh, that dance around the, uh, the robot apocalypse, as it were, um, that talk about the, uh, the automation of the workforce. Um, if it's something you're into, I definitely recommend these three. Uh, there, certainly, there's a lot more uh, out there that are really interesting as well, but I didn't want to go some reading list or anything. So I'll just leave that up so you guys can... Uh, can note those if you want, but um, thank you for coming out. I hope this uh, was informative and enlightening for you.